Greetings everybody, welcome back to Weekly Wildlife Wisdom. As so far, I've been your host, Zero Yeti, and Happy Pride Month, as well as Happy Dinosaur Day. And for this Dinosaur Day, we're going to be going back to focusing on specific formations. In this uh, episode, we're going to be focusing on the Kim Kim beds of Morocco and North Africa. Let's go get into it with the first animal of the week being Afro Tapajera. It is an extinct genus of Tapajarid pterosaur that lived throughout the Albion and early Cenomanian stages of the Cretaceous period, some 110 to 95 million years ago. Although the first remains of Afro Tapajara, consisting of a fragmentary jaw, were on Earth in 1997, it wouldn't be until 2020 that Afro Tapajara would be formally named and described by paleontologists. David Martill, Roy Smith, David M. Unwin, Alexander Keo, James McAfee, and Nizar Ibrahim, based on a partial skull collected from the Kim Kim Formation of Morocco. The hull-type specimen of Afrotaphashera consists of a six-inch long partial rostrum which tapers to a point and preserves the broken base of a sagittal crest near the end of the fragment. The fragment is toothless and the end of the rostrum appears to deflect downward. Two additional specimens are known, similar to the holotype, or preserve smaller and different parts of the beak. Notably, the 1997 mandible referred to the species is also toothless and preserves a deep crest below the mandibular symphysis. Uh, no part of the skeleton outside of the skull is known from Apertaphagera, but comparison to other Tapajera suggests it possessed a skull length of 16 to 20 inches in length uh, and a wingspan of 11.5 to 16.5 feet. Afro Tapajera likely had a large fan shaped sagittal crest formed by soft tissue spanning two bony bases, one on the snout and the other near the rear of the skull, as well as a deep crest on the chin. In life, Afro Tapajera would have inhabited the vast tropical deltas of Cretaceous North Africa, feeding upon various fruits and nuts, as well as the occasional arthropod, mollusk, or small tetrapod, while itself trying to avoid becoming prey to larger large fish, crocodilians, and theropods such as Rugops and Carcharodontosaurus. Next up is Antropristus, which is an extinct genus of sclerorhynchoid carlaginous fish which lived throughout Africa, Europe, and North America during the Cretaceous period some 129 to 72 million years ago, making it one of the oldest and longest lived of the sclerorhynchoid Noid, uh, genus. The first remains, consisting of a fragmentary rostrum, were unearthed on the continental interclare of Algeria by French geologist Gustave Emile Hogg, which he named Gigantichthys nubidus in 1905. That same year, Hogg also named Platyspondylus forini for vertebrae from the same formation. In 1917, Ernst Stromer recognized that hogs finds represented the same species of animal and sported characteristics that made these creatures distinct from either Gigantichthys or Platyspondylus. Stromer then named the new species Antropristus with G. numidus as the type species. Over the next century, hundreds of partial specimens would be unearthed, including those of a second valid species from the Woodbine Formation of Texas. Antropristes Dunkley was named by Charles McNulty Jr. and Bob Slaughter in 1962, reaching 16 to 26 feet in length and 1 to 1 and a half tons in weight. Antropristes sported a 3.5 foot-long barbed rostrum, six fins, one fluke, and a flat body. Antropristus also had both its gills and mouth on the underside of its body, which were adaptations to eating its prey off of the river bed. Interestingly enough, Antopristus' closest living relatives are actually skates, and it convergently evolved to have sawfish and saw shark iconic features and lifestyle. In life, Antropristis would have swam the rivers, lakes, estuaries, and coastlines, feeding upon fish, crustaceans, and mollusks, while themselves being an important food source for creatures such as pliosaurs, mosasaurs, crocodilians, and the infamous Spinosaurus. 
Next up, we have Carcharodontosaurus, which is a genus of large Carcharodontosaur and theropod dinosaur. They existed throughout Africa during the Cenomanian stage of the Cretaceous period, some 100 to 93 million years ago. The first remains of Carcharodontosaurus, existing of two teeth, were uncovered in Algeria by paleontologists uh, Diperet and Savonin in 1924, which they initially named Megalosaurus saharicus before redescribing it as a species of Dryptosaurus. The name Carcharodontosaurus wouldn't arise until 1931, when paleontologist Ernst Stromer, describing a partial skeleton consisting of a partial skull, teeth, vertebrae, claw bones, hip bones, and leg bones, from the Bahariya Formation of Egypt. The teeth in his new findings match those described by Diperet and Salvarin, uh, Salvernin, which led to Stromer conserving the species named Saharicus, but finding it necessary to erect a new genus name for the species, which he dubbed Carcharodontosaurus for their similarities in sharpness and serrations to the teeth of Carcharodon, the great white shark. The fossils described by Stromer were destroyed in 1944 during World War II, but, in a, new more, but a new more complete skeleton was found from the Kim Kim group of Morocco, during an expedition led by paleontologist Paul Serino in 1995. Today, two species are recognized, C. saharicus and C. equidensis, reaching 35 to 45 feet in length and 5 to 9 tons in weight. Carcharodontosaurus ranks amongst the largest theropods, uh, being compared in size, comparable in size to Tyrannosaurus rex, Giganotosaurus, and Spinosaurus. In life, Carcharodontosaurus would have dwelled throughout the wetlands, forests, and estuaries of Cretaceous North Africa, where it fulfilled a role of terrestrial apex predator, feeding upon hadrosaurs, sauropods, and chylosaurines, turtles, crocodilomorphs, and other theropods. Next up, we have Axelrod ichthys, which is an extinct genus of diverse and adaptable Mossonid. Coelocanth, which dwelled throughout the fresh, brackish, and coastal marine waters of Madagascar, mainland Africa, both North and South America, and Europe, during the Aptian to Lower Maastrichtian stages of the Cretaceous period, some 120 to 70 million years ago. The first remains, consisting of several exceptionally preserved whole specimens, were unearthed from the Auripe Basin in northeastern Brazil, in 1986, by a team led by John G. Maisie. Maisie decided to name the genus Axelrod Ichthys in honor of his colleague, American ichthyologist Herbert R. Axelrod. Today, several species are known, including Axelrod Ichthys uh, aripinensis, Axelrod Ichthys maisiae, Axelrod Ichthys lavocati, and Axelrod Ichthys megadromos. With the most, with most of the, uh, with most of these species, reaching three to seven feet in length. However, a few species, such as a lavocati, reach truly gigantic sizes at upwards of thirteen feet in length. Along with the size and habitat, the diet also appears to have varied between species, with some being filter feeders of plankton and krill while others were active predators who swallowed their prey whole using a suction method uh, in a similar manner to present-day coelacanths. Axelrodic these are distinguished from other coelacanthiforms by their more elongated low and wide skulls whose skull roof and cheekbones sported strong ornamentation. Next up we have Rugops, which is a genus of albisaurid theropod dinosaur which inhabited what is now North Africa during the Cenomanian stage of the late Cretaceous period some 100 to 93 million years ago. The first remains of Rugops, consisting of a mostly complete skull, were unearthed by Paul Sorino and his team in 2000, and scientifically described in 2004. This find is heralded as a geological breakthrough as it marked the first albelisaurid dinosaur found in Africa, with all previous 
members being from Madagascar, India, and South America. For this reason, the existence of Rugovs is held up as proof that not only were South America and Africa once joined, but land bridges existed between the two continents after they had split, allowing for new and different kinds of dinosaurs to spread across the globe into new continents. The name Rugops, meaning wrinkle face, comes from the numerous impressions of the skull bone from large blood vessels that once ran across the bony surface, leaving it a wrinkled appearance. It is thought that these extra vessels were there to provide additional oxygen, oxygenated blood to special vibrant facial display features, so far not seeing any other theropod. Alternatively, these vessels could have supplied blood to some kind of armored covering over its face. Standing 5 to 8 feet high at the shoulder and reaching 14 to 18 feet in length, and weighing around 900 pounds, Rugops was a small to medium-sized theropod, which would have inhabited the vast wetlands and flooded forests throughout Cretaceous North Africa, living alone or in small groups, as it fed upon small herbivores and scavenged the kills of larger carnivores such as Carcharodontosaurus and Spinosaurus. Next up is uh, Aripe Sucus, which is also known as the Rat Croc or the Dog Croc, is a genus of extinct Notosuchian crocodiliform that lived throughout South America, Madagascar, and mainland Africa from the Barramanian to the Maastrichtian stages of the Cretaceous period. Uh, some 125 to 66 million years ago. The first remains of Arepesuchus, consisting of a near-complete skull and lower jaw, was unearthed from the famed Satana group of the Arepe Basin in Brazil by Dr. Price in 1959. Today, six species are recognized, including A. Gomenzi from Brazil, A. Patagonicus, and A. Brutan Arensis from Chile and Argentina, A. Ta Singa Tasingana from Madagascar, and A. Wingiri and A. Ratodis from North Africa. Reaching 3 to 6 feet in length, 44 to 88 pounds in weight, Arepa Sucus, that can be distinguished by their large eyes and unique skulls, which bowl laterally on the edges of the snout. They also had thin osteoderms that covered the entire body with multiple rows of them across the back, belly, and a set of large paired dorsal ones along the tail. The osteoderms were not strongly keeled, which along with the long limb bones and shoulder, hip, and ankle joints that suggested an upright posture indicate that Arepasuchus was more, of an active, more active on land than in the water. Study of the dentition reveals that Arepasuchus may have been a generalist hunter. This, in, this is indicated by the sharp conical teeth towards the front of the mouth with a more rounded, sturdier teeth towards the back. These two sets of teeth are separated in, uh, by both the upper and lower jaws by enlarged t- canines that were used for killing small prey such as arthropods, lizards, amphibians, mammals, eggs, uh, small pterosaurs, and even small or hatchling dinosaurs. And our last animal of the week is uh, Rebechisaurus, which is an extinct genus of sauropod dinosaur of the superfamily Diplodocidae that lived throughout Africa and possibly South America during the Cenomanian stage of the Cretaceous period some 193 million years ago. The first remains consisting of 10 ribs, the right shoulder blade, 11 vertebrae, the sacrum, the humerus, and two pelvic bones were collected from the Iofoeus formation of Morocco between 1948 and 1952 by French paleontologist René Lavocat. He named the type species R. Garrasbe, but only the shoulder blade and a single vertebrae from the string of 11 were initially described, very briefly and without illustrations. The fossils were left undescribed and neglected until 2015 when Jeffrey Wilson and Ronan Allian cleaned the holotype and described the remaining fossils that Lovacat never described in 1954. 
Currently, there are two valid species, being A. garris bay and A. tamanensis. Additionally, the Rebeccasaurus rheosaurus agrioensis from Argentina, named by Jose Bonaparte in 1996, is believed to be possibly synonymous with Rebeccasaurus garris bay, and the two species are nearly identical. Reaching 60 to 80 feet in length and 12 to 40 tons in weight, Rebechisaurus possessed a small head and a long, graceful neck and a whip-like tail. Rebechisaurus is further distinguished from other sauropods by its unusually tall, ridged back, which is thought to have sported a spine or sail. In life, Rebechisaurus inhabited the wetlands, coastal deltas, and flooded forests of North Africa and possibly South America, where it traveled in herds, feeding upon shrubs and trees alongside strange crocodiliforms, gigantic fish, unusual pterosaurs, and some of the most titanic theropods to ever live. As always, take care to my guys, gals, and non-binary pals.